and Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. TVO celebrates our 50th anniversary this year, and that offers us an opportunity to look back at some of our favorite conversations. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, and that's next on The Agenda in the Summer. It started as a much anticipated vacation in Egypt. It resulted in a life and death struggle against an antibiotic resistant infection. The medical thriller is detailed in The Perfect Predator, a scientist raised to save her husband from a deadly superbug. Its co-authors are Stephanie Strathdee, Associate Dean of Global Health Sciences at the University of California, San Diego School of Medicine, who now directs at School Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics and the patient, Dr. Thomas Patterson, Distinguished Professor of Psychiatry at UC San Diego. Welcome to you both. Thank you very much for having us. After yes. reading this book, um, it's so nice to see you, Tom. It's good to be here. Right. Um, <laughs> I mean, you, this book is about something that was really traumatic that happened to you both. Now you're talking about it, um, which I'm thinking brings up a lot of bad memories. Uh, Stephanie, why write this book? Well, we realized, as crazy as it sounds, that we were privileged. We had the resources and the connections to find a 100-year-old forgotten cure and to bring it back and to save him in the nick of time. And we want to pay it forward. There's 1.5 million people dying of superbugs every year right now, and that problem's getting worse. And we want to make sure that they have easier access to this life-saving therapy than we did. So let's talk about how it all started. Um, Tom, how did you first get sick? We were on a vacation in Egypt last night of the uh, trip. Mm. We were in Luxor, right across from the Valley of the Kings. Beautiful evening, starlit on the top deck of the ship. Mm. We were the only ones there. We had a wonderful meal, went to bed, right as rain. I was as healthy as you could imagine, a bit overweight. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and this isn't a, uh, an ad for a diet, let me tell you that. Mm -hmm. But, um, he went to bed and then I woke up and was throwing up and just kept getting worse and worse and worse all night long. And then Steph called a doctor, a local doctor, who came to the ship and uh, gave me fluids and antibiotics and said, ah, it's just food poisoning. He'll be well in no time. Mm -hmm. And so I kept getting sicker. I started. And you were you were actually adamant about. You told Steph that don't call the the hospital, don't call a doctor. Right. I'm fine. But uh, Steph, eventually you did. Um, when did you realize that Tom was really really sick? Well, I'm, I have a PhD in infectious disease epidemiology, and so I thought this was food poisoning. And I was in my mind, I was calculating incubation periods of what bug could have, you know, caused this. But you know, I know just enough about medicine to get me into trouble, right? Yeah. So when he started complaining about back pain, it was kind of like, well, wait a second, this doesn't sound like any kind of food poisoning. Mm -hmm. And so I contacted Chip Schooley, the head of infectious diseases back home at our university in San Diego, and I asked him. I said, you know, I googled these symptoms and it's coming up pancreatitis, but you know, you can't really be a Dr. Google. Like, what do you think? And he said, well, it could be pancreatitis, but it could be a twisted mm -hmm. bowel or something worse. So mm -hmm. just get them like to a doctor and, and, or a hospital as soon as you can. And you, vent you had insurance um, and you were able to medevac um, Tom to Germany. Um, Tom, what was the final uh, diagnosis? Well, I had a, um, I had pancreatitis that was caused by a gallstone that had gotten into my pancreatic duct and blocked it and formed a huge pseudocyst. Mm -hmm. uh, initially, they thought, you know, they, they looked at the fluid from it in Germany and said, this is murky, looks bad, this can't have just formed. So they cultured it. And the guy came back all dressed in gown and covered, you know, protective gear and said, this is the worst bacteria on the planet. That was, I'm not even going to try to pronounce this thing. Mm. It's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's called, uh, I guess, what I, I'm going to call it an Iraqi bacter. Well, that's well, what's the, the nickname. Oh, that's the, the scientific name is Acinetobacter bomanii. Uh -huh. 
And Say it, that five times fast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I can, but I'd probably flub it up. <laughs> but it's called Arachobacter for short since so many veterans come back from the Middle East with this type of bacteria. And it actually has kind of infiltrated regional hospitals all over Western Europe and North America. So the most common place that you acquire it these days is in a hospital or clinic. And he could have acquired it there in Egypt. We know it was an Egyptian strain, mm. but we all never really know for sure. This wasn't the first time that you were dealing with a superbug. You both actually had MRSA. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, I mean, the lives that you lead. But um, you start this story uh, in the middle in the middle when Tom has been sick for almost three months. And you're on a conference call with your colleagues, Stephanie. Um, what happens during that call? Well, I mean, Tom was in the hospital for a long time. And um, this one particular day, I was supposed to be on a retreat in San Francisco. And I thought, well, I can't be there in person. I'll just call in for a little bit. and. During a break, my colleagues, um, one of whom was a chancellor um, at a university in California, a former surgeon, he says, how's Tom doing? And I you know, tell him what's going on. And then I say, oh, I see the doctor's coming. I got to hang up. And he thinks that I've hung up the phone mm -hmm. and I'm still on. And he says to my other colleague, has anybody told Steph that her husband is going to die? And I thought to myself, I'm holding the phone, cradling it in my hands like a baby. And I thought, no, you know, nobody has. And he didn't mean to mm -hmm. say that and have me hear it, but it also kicked me into gear to like, you know, say, I got to do something here. Mm -hmm. um, it must have been, because I've noticed since you've sat down, you, you're holding hands, you're yeah. very much in love. Um, that must have been, in that moment, what did that feel like? Well, it, it it kind of was the, the reality. I thought to myself, you know, my colleagues here at the University of California, San Diego, are, are treating Tom, and they probably don't want to tell me that he's dying, but he, I can see little by little each day. I mean, the, 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 the cheekbones were sticking out. I could put my, my knuckles behind the orbits in his eyes. I, day by day, he was slipping away. Mm -hmm. And when I realized he was dying, I, I realized I had better you know, do something because modern medicine has run out of antibiotics. It was resistant to everything. Tom, how close did you come to dying? Well, I, uh, the doctor said I was as close as anybody could possibly be. Mm -hmm. I spent a total of nine months in the hospital, had seven cases of septic shock. I was as near death as you could possibly get. We often hear about um, people who have near uh, death experiences uh, lying there. Uh, in the, you had a few moments when you were conscious. Um, in those moments, did you make peace with the possibility of you dying? Well, I would say that I had a lot of practice dying mm. and that I'm better prepared today than I was before, but I'm still not ready. I still have a lot of life in me, but I still think a lot about what life is about and why I'm here. And um, so my time in the hospital, I spent at least three months in hallucinating. And those hallucinations that we're describing in the book some really are parts of the fears that I have, part of what was going on in the real world. And I've been analyzing those, trying to figure out exactly what they mean. You had a family and friends, Stephanie. Um, they were there in the hospital with you once you were moved back to the States. Um, did you, were you aware of them? Did you hear what they were saying to you? Well, that's a good point. I mean, there's, there's two parts to this. Mm -hmm. First, yes, while I was in a coma, while I was unconscious, I was conscious at some level. I could hear people talking to me. And that wasn't like a conversation like you and I are having here now. But you know you hear it in the distance, and so you it helps you to sustain yourself during that period, and that's the second part of the point, which mm -hmm. is I was very fortunate that family friends were by my bedside literally 24/7. They arranged a, a a schedule so that somebody was there all the time talking to me. So one of my daughters sang songs and talked to me about what was going on. Mm -hmm. The other daughter read bird books, because I'm a bird watcher. Mm -hmm. And those things sustained me. In fact, I believe that they kept me from getting cognitively impaired, mm -hmm. because the odds of becoming cognitively impaired, having been in a coma, are very great. And um, I'm very fortunate. And um, there were moments, too, when um, Stephanie would take your hand, and you had to ask him, this is your life. Yeah. Do you want me to continue fighting um, this? Um, do you remember that or? 
Well, at the moment that she asked me whether I wanted to live, she said, you're, it's, you've been fighting a long time. Do you want to live or not? It's up to you. And you know, I'll do everything I can to save you if you say yes. Mm -hmm. At that moment, I was hallucinating that I was a snake. And when, the, when I say I was hallucinating that I was a snake, I mean I was a snake, mm -hmm. which um, probably came from the fact, I mean, these hallucinations are really a combination of the toxic part of the infection that I had, some of the antibiotics are toxic, mm -hmm. losing sleep, being in an ICU is in itself going to create uh, this kind of hallucinations and, and you had whatnot. so many tubes attached to your oh body. Oh my God, I, mean, I was just as, you know, yeah. it was a mess. Um, and uh, we should, the Iraqi bacter, it's, um, we should probably make a, a distinction. Is it a bacteria or a virus? It's a virus. It's a bacteria. It's a bacteria. The cure was the virus. With the virus, which is the phages. That's right. Which we'll get into a few minutes. Yeah. Um, why is the Iraqi bacter such a deadly um, uh, bacteria? Well, you know, this was an organism that I used to plate on my Petri dishes back when I was at the University of Toronto in the 1980s. In my microbiology classes, we were dealing with this organism just like others, and it was considered a pretty wimpy organism. Um, but over the years, it's become something of a bacterial kleptomaniac. It's really great at stealing antibiotic resistance genes from other bacteria. And so when we're throwing back antibiotics at um, an infection, you're killing all of the friendly bacteria in the microbiome. Mm -hmm. And this particular superbug can move in for the kill. So basically, Tom had this giant abscess in his abdomen, which became a nice little condo for this superbug mm -hmm. to move right into and go, oh, yes, thank you very much. You've killed all of my competition. Mm -hmm. And that's what ended up taking him down. How many antibiotics were used in Tom's treatment? You know, I lost count, mm -hmm. but right from the beginning when he, you know, because he was first medevac to Germany, it was resistant to 15 antibiotics right off the top. But by the time he was medevac to San Diego a few weeks later, it was resistant to everything. Well, I want to talk more about antibiotics, and this <clears throat> is um, something that you write in the book, um, and I'll read it. More than 150 antibiotics have been developed since the discovery of penicillin, and for the majority of antibiotics available, resistance has emerged and gone global. At the rate that scientists now know that bacteria develop resistance, researchers would need to create about 35 new classes of antibiotics each century to stay ahead of bacterial pathogens. Instead, no new antibiotic drug class has entered the market since 1980, and no new class of antibiotics has been discovered to treat gram-negative bacteria like A. bobani since 1962, before I was born. How did so many antibiotics come to lose their efficiency? Well, I think that, you know, we as a society kind of grew complacent, thinking that, well, this first antibiotic, penicillin, is, is a broad-spectrum antibiotic. It kills a lot of different bacteria, and that's great. So now that we have others, that we'll just keep ahead of the bacteria. Um, but we didn't realize to the extent that they're multiplying. Like Tom's bacteria was multiplying every 20 minutes, like just boom, boom, boom. But also the globalization of our world these days means that if there's an antibiotic resistance gene that is, um, you know, identified in China, like one was in November 2015, the year, the month that Tom got sick, by the time that paper came out reporting this antibiotic resistance gene, which was to colistin, that's the last resort antibiotic that was developed in World War II, not exactly a wonder drug, but it was, it's our, you know, our last hope for a lot of these conditions. Um, that one antibiotic resistance gene spread to 30 countries, like just like that. So we haven't been on top of this. We haven't had very good surveillance. So we, we have these now superbugs that are undetected, mm -hmm. undiagnosed, and now they're untreatable. Why is that? Why aren't we seeing new antibiotics in the wake of all these super uh, deadly superbugs? Well, it's complex, but basically uh, pharmaceutical companies have decided that it's not cost effective for them to develop new antibiotics, especially now that organizations like the World Health Organization are saying, well, any new antibiotic that comes on the scene, we've got to save it for a last resort. Mm -hmm. So one of the experts in the field says, like, it's kind of like telling people you should buy a fire extinguisher. It costs a lot of money, but you might never need it. So they're kind of saying, well, we're going to move out of the pharmaceutical antibiotic uh, pipeline mm -hmm. and, move, and move our direction into something else. So a lot of pharmas, there's only, I think, three or four pharmaceutical companies that are big pharmas that are still working in this area.
And, and for Tom's treatment, uh, the doctors for a while were trying to contain um, the Arachibacter in a psycho uh, pseudocyst. Well, a pseudocyst, just think of it as a giant abscess okay. in his abdomen. Uh, in, in his stomach. Um, but what happened, Tom? Or maybe I should ask Stephanie because you were. Yeah, that's it exactly. Yeah, right. I was going to say. He doesn't remember. Uh. But you can ask him, but I'll, I end up correcting him anyway. So what happened was because he was so weak, um, by the time he got medevaced back to San Diego, mm -hmm. the doctor said, like, if we operate to try to take this abscess out, I'm, he's probably going to die, and it's resistant to everything. This superbug. So if it gets in his bloodstream and he has septic shock, he's probably going to die from that. So they said, look, the best resort is for us to poke holes in his abdomen and put these catheters or drains in there to try to siphon it off. Mm -hmm. And he had like five drains in his abdomen. And by the time, you know, he, he actually started to get a little bit better. But one of those internal drains slipped one day. And right in front of me, he went into septic shock because this, this drain dumped all of that infected fluid from the abscess into his abdomen, into his blood. And he, he just started dying, like, right there. And we had to get him right back to the ICU. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of what was almost the end. Well, um, I want to get more into detail, but we're running out of time. And I want to talk about, you know, you did find a solution. Um, you got um, an idea from the past. Uh, what are phages? Well, phages are bacteriophages, um, are viruses that have naturally evolved to attack bacteria. Mm -hmm. So there's you know, thought to be 10 million, trillion, trillion phages on the planet. They're everywhere. Um, Where do in, they come from? They're, well, they're in soil, they're in water, they're wherever you find bacteria. So mm -hmm. if, if you are going on a phage hunt to try to find phages that match a specific kind of bacteria because they're, they're very specific in their you know, host-parasite relationship, then you, you can go to sewage. That's one of the best places because there's a lot of bacteria there, so there's a lot of the perfect predator to mm -hmm. prey on these bacteria. So that uh, some of the... You know, the, the phages that we used to treat Tom were directly sourced from sewage. So, you know, I like to tell him that he's Come on, full of yeah. <laughs> I'll let your readers and you know, watchers use their imagination. Yeah. But why aren't phages in greater use today? Well, you know, phages were actually discovered by a French Canadian, uh, Felix Durrell, in 1917. And he used them to treat people um, with bacterial infections. In fact, so did many other doctors for quite a while. They had something of a heyday in the 1920s and 30s. Um, he was the inspiration for um, the, the book Aerosmith, the main protagonist in that book. But penicillin came on the scene, and also this was around the time of World War II, and uh, because penicillin wasn't widely available in Eastern Europe and, and Russia, mm -hmm. it, phage therapy took off there, and it was embraced. So it was seen as so something of a commie, you know, science and, and commie medicine, and um, that didn't go over really well in the West. Mm -hmm. So there was this geopolitical bias that really hung over phage therapy for decades. And so it's difficult to find them and to get your hands on them. How did you eventually get your hands on some of them? Well, um, when I went to the literature on the internet, um, I, I looked for researchers that were studying his superbug and the phages that attack them. And I made a list of those that were in the U.S. because I thought they had to be close by because we're running out of time to save Tom. And it was a darn short list, and I wrote them all, and one from Texas A&M University wrote me back and said, I'll help you. And they did. And so many things, we were talking about this before we started taping, um, there were so many things that lined up to make it possible for Tom to be sitting here. Uh, you had strangers helping you. Um, how did that feel to have uh, people want to help your husband? Well, it was it was absolutely fantastic. It, it puts the kind in humankind. Mm -hmm. You know, to think that a global village of total strangers, phage researchers from all over the world, the FDA, the, the U.S. Mm -hmm. Navy, um, all stepped up to the plate, including um, the, the physicians and the nursing staff at UC San Diego. Without them, I mean, he would have been a goner. Um, but, you know, the, the FDA officials said, look, you know, we were looking for somebody like this uh, to be able to gather the data 
data, we need to show that phage therapy is, is promising as a, mm -hmm. as a therapy for superbug infections. What we needed was a dying patient, a family member who was willing to take the risk, a doctor who was willing to take it on, a, a phage research community that was willing to find the phages in time, and an institution that was going to, you know, like, go through with the possibility that the patient might die and somebody might sue them. And they got their perfect patient in Tom Patterson. And uh, eventually you wake up um, to the great relief of so many people. Um, but then there were so many things, so many challenges ahead for you. You had to relearn how to swallow, how to talk, how to walk. Uh, what was that like to relearn all those things? Well, after nine months in the hospital, I had lost 100 pounds. And as you say, I had to basically learn everything as if I was a baby again, which mm -hmm. is an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's as much psychological as it is physical. What you, people don't really appreciate, I think, is the amount of psychological stress that comes into as a patient, but also for family. My, you know, Steph and I, my daughters all had PTSD as a result of this. So Post-traumatic stress disorder? Mm -hmm. Correct. So it takes up five times as long to recover from a illness like mine as it does to actually have it. So about four years of recovery time. So nine months times five, right? Yeah. You got it. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's uh, I'm about three years into my recovery. Mostly I'm doing fantastic, mm -hmm. but sometimes I, you know, I need a nap. Mm -hmm. My friends say, we all need naps. Yeah. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> what have you enjoyed? What did you enjoy most um, after you woke up? Uh, well, things maybe that you may have taken for granted before. Well, I mean, I could say family and friends, and that's so obvious. Mm -hmm. I mean, how could I not mean that? Mm -hmm. But it, the first thing that might surprise you and still I have an amazing response to is a glass of ice water. Mm. I, I mean, knew he was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, it's just so so precious mm. to feel that in your mouth and have it trickle down your throat into your stomach and mm. makes you feel so alive. Mm. A glass of ice water is the last thing I would have imagined that I would have. I would have thought, oh, it was steak or something mm -hmm. like that. Or surfing. Or surfing. <laughs> yeah. That would have been nice. <laughs> um, Stephanie, how important is Tom's case in getting phage treatment some respect? Well, it's actually been incredible. Um, his story went viral when it was presented at the 100th anniversary of the discovery of bacteriophage mm -hmm. in 2017 in Paris. Um, and as a result of that, immediately people started contacting me and his doctors asking for phage therapy for their loved ones. And then their doctors started calling us. Luckily, our chancellor at UC San Diego gave us some seed money to open up the first phage therapy center in North America called mm -hmm. IPATH or the Center for Innovative Phage Applications and Therapeutics. And our goal really is to take phage therapy into clinical trials so that it can be proven efficacious. And if it is, then it could be licensed alongside antibiotics. We don't ever think it's going to replace antibiotics, but in Tom's case and several others, there's actually been synergism between the phage and the antibiotics that and makes the antibiotics, well yeah, and it makes the antibiotics work better or, or work when they were failing. Mm -hmm. So that's also making the, the biotech and pharma um, industry take a second look. But we've now met people that their lives have actually been saved as a result of Tom's case. And, you know, it's pretty mind-blowing. Well, I want to read um, something from your book, uh, one more pa pa um, passage. Uh, you write, one month after Tom was discharged from the hospital, a 2016 UN General Assembly report called for multi-sectorial and cross-sectorial efforts and engagement of all relevant sectors of society, human and veterinary medicine, agriculture, finance, environment, industry, and consumers to tackle the global superbug crisis. Um, what have governments done to tackle the crisis since 2016? Well, you know, a scorecard came out fairly recently by the same organization that, that really generated that report in 2016. And they said, you know, progress has been really slow. Um, the United Kingdom has actually been one of the leaders in this area. Um, Canada has made some progress. They um, made it, um, you know, illegal to pre prescribe antibiotics that are medically important to livestock, which will hopefully, you know, minimize the misuse of antibiotics. But um, we have a long way to go. And um, it's estimated that by the year 2050, one person will be dying every three seconds of superbug infections, and that it's a more immediate threat in our lifetimes than climate change. And the average person doesn't know that. That's terrifying. Yeah. 
Um, it must mean, um, what does that mean? You said before that, you know, now because of Tom's recovery, there is, I guess, a prototype. <laughs> <laughs> a um, large animal model. <laughs> <laughs> but a scientist, you know, now you are able to, uh, long after you're both gone, you've left this kind of legacy. It was really traumatic for your family. But what does it mean for you to be able to contribute to the world of science in this way? Well, I think that that's a really profound question. Um, you know, for us, we realized that, that we were privileged and the average person who is dying of a superbug infection these days is in a developing country that doesn't have any resources. But there's a lot of sewage in places like, you know, India and China and other places. And if we could harness the powers of the, that sewage to hunt for phages and to have a, a phage bank, really, that makes phage therapy more accessible to people, mm -hmm. You know, we could really get a handle on this, and and it, that makes us feel like our lives and the and really the terror that we lived through for nine months and our families did makes it really worthwhile. Um, you you mentioned the privilege that you had because of your positions. Uh, for people watching today, how can they access this kind of treatment? Well, right now, phage therapy is still experimental in the U.S. and in Canada and many parts of Western Europe. Mm -hmm. But if you're in North America, you can contact us at ipath at ucsd.edu or have your infectious disease physician contact us and we can see if we can help. And why didn't you not give up, uh, Stephanie? I mean, in the book, you write about a time when you were a small child. Somebody set fire to your jacket and you kind of just brushed it off and kept going. Why did you not give up? Why did you keep going? Well, first, you know, I love this guy. <laughs> um, and I so it really started as, you know, um, I wanted to save my husband's life. Um, but after that, um, I realized that we have the potential to save many more lives. And I knew that Tom was a scientist and that even if he died, he would want his death to mean something. Mm -hmm. And so there I was in the hospital saying, get the baseline sample. And some of the doctors are looking at me like, this woman is kind of nuts. Her husband is dying and she should be holding his hand. I was holding his hand, but I was also the scientist. Uh, what kind of impact has this had on your relationship, Tom? Um, we were close before, but how could you get any closer than we are now? Right. I mean, this is the most special relationship you can imagine. And if you ever get into a fight, Stephanie has a trump card, right? <laughs> <laughs> he takes out the garbage every week without me asking. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure to have you both here, and we're so happy to see you healthy. Um, you. And I hope this will be made into a movie because, wow, the happy ending is great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And that's it for tonight's agenda in the summer. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. We'll see you again next time. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.